Hi, everyone. Today we're going to update our chatbots lecture to include a new package that actually works with newer versions of Python. So let's get started. What are chatbots? Well, they're all around us because we use them fairly frequently and they've sort of become integrated into our daily lives. So things like Siri and Google and ChatGPT are all fancy chatbots. But what if you're wanting something a bit simpler for your current role um, at, a, at a job? What kind of thing can you build? Well, Chatbot is an interactive system between an end user and the computer system, usually through text, but sometimes through speech. Okay. So things like Smarter Child, for uh, dating myself here, from AOL Messenger, things like OK Google, Siri, Alexa, and many, many more. Okay. Now, places can build their own custom chatbots. So things like UPS, FedEx, and so on have their own chatbots on websites. And most websites have these now that have, deal with customers to sort of help you filter out individuals who don't need to talk to a live person, but instead can get their question answered by frequently asked questions or helping direct the person to the right live person to talk to. Okay. And so these are conversational interfaces. So it could be talk, it could be text, it could be swipe. You know, and we're sort of used to these terrible phone system ones where it's like, just give me a live person. But we use the uh, computer system ones all the time. Since these all require text, chatbots are mostly a, a complex NLP task. But it doesn't have to be super complex. There are things like ChatGPT, which are very complex deep learning systems. And then there are simple Q&A dialogue systems that you can program yourself. So brief history. They were actually some of the first AI tasks that people decided to build. And so we've got um, one of the originals from uh, Weizenbaum with Eliza. And even though people knew they were talking to a computer, people who were talking to Eliza in the dialogue system would attribute emotion to the program and actually grew attached to the program even though they knew it was a computer. But you have to remember that that time period, that was one of the only types of those systems. So it was very unique. I don't think now many of us would get super attached to UPS's where's my package system, right? Now DARPA has really helped move this area forward in the United States. This is our defense program. Um, and building communication systems for soldiers. And so I like a lot of a lot of things, the military has funneled money into artificial intelligence systems and has really helped make this a, a growing area. Okay. What happened then was it transformed into frequently asked question systems because businesses realized how they could capitalize on this new technology. And chatbots now are really common. Right, you might talk to one five times today, even if you aren't aware. So APIs, the um, access, you know, uh, interfaces between different systems, um, allow people to build them without too much coding experience. Now, the one we're going to look at today, you could build the whole thing without any coding experience, but it would be augmented by having good coding experience. So what could I use those for? Well, so for shopping and e-commerce, I could build a recommendation system, can help people with their orders, with their payments. I could um, annoy them online with the little pop-ups. Um, we can use them to help find the news that we are interested in. We could build customer service chatbots that take complaints, answer frequently asked questions, direct them to the right agent to answer their question. In the medical field, we can help patients fetch the information they need. My um, doctor has one that helps me schedule appointments. It's not very complicated, but it forces you to go through this system to schedule appointments. And so we can build all of these systems. Now, Amazon has a really great system um, as part of their uh, machine learning systems that you get those kind of a point and click dialogue flow that you can build. And so here's an example of what that looks like. Um, and so the user will enter a question. The system processes that question. It looks for the correct answer within that system and then provides them the right answer. So it's essentially a fancy dictionary lookup, 
But you have to realize how complicated that really is. So when I ask you a question, the first thing you have to figure out is the intent. And you'll see in the system we're going to talk about today that intent is one of the main components that you add. And so it's almost like a starting with a classification system, which we just finished that section of here's this question, which intent do I put it into? So part of the pipeline is classifying the user's input into a specific intent. That intent then leads you to a specific story flow of like back and forth, the kinds of answers that you might give. So for example, can I export a model? No. What is the purpose of Amazon's machine learning system? And then it gives you an answer. What kind of chatbots are there? Well, there's exact answer or frequently asked questions chatbots. These are the most common probably, and one of the more easy ones to program because they have specific if this, then that rules. And so you can map out all of the potential flows that you are interested in, which we're gonna call stories. It's got a fixed set of inputs, retrieve the correct responses, and the conversation is not tracked. So it doesn't remember the last answer to help it inform the next answer. Okay. These are dumb systems, if you will. Flow-based bots, on the other hand, are more complex in their ability to process these responses, and it can remember the previous response to help inform the next response. So they maintain that information during the conversation. So if we were thinking about um, deep learning models, these would might be something like a long, short-term memory model. So it can remember the previous answers to help um, input to the next answer. This is sort of like what people do, right? It remembers the context of the conversation. Open-ended bots, very complicated. Okay, flow-based bots are a little bit, are like we're going from simplest to hardest here. Open-ended bots are more things like chat GPT. They're in for entertainment to talk about a whole bunch of different types of topics. Um, there's no specific flow for conversations that makes them much more much more difficult to program. Um, and one of the things that you need is a system that has seen many training data pieces and sort of has the ability to construct answers on the fly. So uh, I would say the first two are, are somewhat easy. To, the first one's very easy to program. The second one's in the medium category. And the last one is things left to think to places like Google, Amazon. Could you program your own open-ended bot? Yes. It will be better uh, the more data that you have. And so that's why something like ChatGPT is so powerful is because they have a ton of data and a ton of servers, right? So that needs a lot of inputs and outputs to, to have a, a system that talks to you pretty naturally. So I mentioned a smarter child from the old AOL Instant Messenger days. It didn't chat very naturally. It wasn't that, wasn't, um, you knew you were talking to a computer. Now we'll say with ChatGPT, also know I'm talking to a computer. It's the most verbose computer I have ever met, right? So it, talk, it gives you a lot of output uh, when you ask it questions. Okay, so let's look at an example of these from the book, right? And so if you um, take some time to read these, there's no real conversational flow in the FAQ box. So is there a limit to the size of data sets? If I ask it again, what's the maximum size of training data set? It gives me the same answer again. I want to order a spinach and feta pizza. What size would you like? Medium pizza, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it's remembering um, the information that you said before. So it doesn't ask you to answer the same question twice. Okay. And then an open-ended bot would give you more information, more conversational flow. Now, goal-oriented dialogue are, thing, are the types of systems that we're gonna talk about this is where you have a, a plan. There's a reason that you are having this conversation. You wanna get from X to Z, right? So these have a goal of getting or exchanging information. And so chatbots have a similar goal, right? Usually with the business, they're domain specific. So one of the, the more difficult parts, so just like NER, right? We talked about how NER systems are very brittle because they often have to be programmed to a domain specific or use case specific idea, you have that same problem with chatbots. To make them very domain general, you need something large like ChatGPT or Siri or Alexa, right? If um, 
you are trying to, you know, have it answer the frequently asked questions on your own e-commerce site, much more restricted domain area. And so you have to build your own training data for those types of things. There isn't just a set already out there. There are pre kind of pre-populated starting points, but then you have to add your components to it. Okay. So we have to program those specific domain areas and that limits its generalizability. So it's not gonna move over to the next one. And that's why if you want something more open-ended, it's easier to use and pay for the API on big programs like um, ChatGPT. So for example, Snatch, Snapchat's chat feature in the background um, is just ChatGPT. But the frameworks on which these systems are built, usually some sort of deep learning model, are generalizable. So the model, the trained model may not be generalizable, but the framework in which we build the model, put the data into is generalizable. So we have to keep it straight that there is, you know, there's this feature extraction, right? And this algorithm building and then the outputs. That pipeline is generalizable, okay? but not the training of that pipeline. So that does make it a little bit easier for us because we can take these systems, like one we're going to use today is called Rasa. I assume it's a joke on Tabula Rasa, <laughs> where blank slate. Um, but uh, their pipeline is very generalizable. Okay? But the data that we input into it has to be our own. Okay? And that's the same idea with NER. The pipelines for NER are fairly generalizable. I mean, we still have to program them a bit ourselves. Uh, as we saw with Snorkel and with Spacey's kind of ability to add components to it. Uh, but the training data is where we end up getting getting to doing the most work. Okay. So a chit chat <laughs> versus a goal oriented system is an open domain conversation, right? So this is no goal really. You're just ch you're just chit chatting, right? Just having a uh, having a talk. The chatbot then is required to be on topic, and that's where people mostly notice that they aren't talking to a real person, is that the, the, these systems are, it's very easy to get them off topic because they grab the most, the, the, the most salient feature from a sentence and will go off that way as opposed to the more generalized domain knowledge in a system sentence. So let me go back. I think this is easy to see, no, 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 too far back in, where, okay, now I've lost it. Flow based bot, here we go. So it's open-ended bot, I'm fine. I went to the beach, okay. Um, I really like going to the beach, but I read about plastics. Oh, okay, we should control plastic. Oh, okay, well, did you watch this movie? Yes, it's great. So it's kind of like it's jumping around a little bit. So you, you see that more with the chit chat systems because, um, well, people also do this, but because they, they, there's only so many options to pick which semantic area to go to next, right? And so that is a bit easier for humans to do than computers. Okay, so chat GPT is an example of one of these systems. And we've had a plural proliferation of other ones since its release. Um, it's really inspired a lot of folks. Right? And they're very expensive to run. So let's see about the pipeline that we would, that in theory, the whole system takes up. Right? So if we have a speech system, one like Siri that recognizes speech, we have to get it to recognize the speech and translate that into text. Then there's a section called natural language understanding. And you see this in Rasa's um, uh, files. That's one of their files they call. This is where we understand the intent, the domain area, the meaning behind the message. Okay? And so that's often pulled from the meaning of the individual words, which sort of works. Um, and so this is one of the harder things to get. What is the overall summarization, if you will, of the of the input? Okay. Once I've figured that out, I have some sort of dialogue manager that says, okay, I got this input. Here's a here's a set of outputs that I can give back to the customer based on this intent. Okay. 
Um, that dialogue manager might be doing something else in the background. So the one we're going to do today is um, what time is it? Okay. So I work with a lot of international scientists and I'm always like, what time is it in Europe? I have no idea, right? Um, because most, most of my collaborators are in Europe, so I'm always like, are they six hours ahead or is it five hours? Is it daylight savings time? What time is it there? Right. And so the dialogue manager is the piece that picks what to say back, but it might talk to a task manager and say, they want to know what time it is. Tell me what time it is. Okay, so the dialogue manager doesn't control the retrieval of information. It says, get me this information and it comes back. Okay, so we'll see this in the program today. There's an NLU file. There's basically this kind of domains um, response stories file. Uh, and the task manager is an actions file. And we'll go back all over all of those in a little bit. Once I figure out the intent, I have a, a file that says, here are the things that I can say back. Now, if it's a more complex system, like it doesn't have pre-canned responses, it's generating those based on Markov models or deep learning models. There's a lot of different possibilities here. And then if it's talking back to you, it's text-to-speech synthesis. Okay, so if you don't have it talking to you, you can skip these two. So there's kind of this like um, workflow and then it would start all over. You would say something back and it would do this again. Okay. And that pipeline can be well-defined. It's just the inputs into the natural language, like each one of these boxes is what you have to do as the, as the creator. Okay. So we don't have to reinvent the wheel on building the system, we have to build the system um, for our for our customization. Okay. Now, speech recognition. So not all systems need that, but a great deal of them do. Um, and so this might be the, the old school terrible phone systems, all the way up to something like okay Google. Okay. The there are lots of algorithms that help translate speech to text. So like if I'm talking, give my phone directions. Uh, our natural language understanding, where the system parses the text and picks um, picks the intent of the text. So the intent might include named entity recognition, right? What's the time in New York? That includes NER. It might include co-reference resolution that we talked about in our NER section, like um, what's the president's birthday? So I got to figure out map president onto the current president, right? mapping requests to our frequently asked questions, looking up information, et cetera. Okay. Then our dialogue and task manager figures out the, 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 takes the intent of the text and figures out which pieces are important. It connects that to the required responses using the um, task manager, and then spits that back into the natural language generation component where it generates the response in a way that's natural if it's a chit chat system or canned responses, if it's a dialogue or a goal oriented system. Okay. And so that can be either template based or generative. Okay, so goal oriented systems tend to be template based because they have a specific goal. It doesn't matter if it's supernatural. Generative models take the basic concepts. So if you think about a deep learning model, it grabs the right ten tensor, if you will, and then predicts the next output based on those contexts. Okay. So when we did word to vec we talked about how word to vec embeds the context-free section. So it might be predicting the words based on the current context. Okay. And then if it's a speech system, it'll talk back to you. So it does uh, text to speech. All right. So unless it's a simple FAQ bot, dialogue systems require remembering information about the turn. So when you're taking turns, it does help if you remember the last turn so you don't say the same thing over and over again. Okay. So a turn is the input from the user followed by the response from the system. Okay. A dialogue act or intent, this is more communication theory, right? Is why the user is the intent, right? So what the user is trying to get out of the turn based, right? So you could be talking about the most, um, your favorite movie. So the intent here is discussion, right? But this is where domain specificity comes in. So my intent might be to figure out the time zone. Now there are slots or entities 
So the um, system we're going to use today calls them entities. Okay? And that contains a specific information tied to the intents. Okay, So it uses the word intent as well. And then it, it uses the word dialogue. So dialogue being turn, 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 turn. So it kind of creates what's called a story. So here are the, the potential turns to do. And then you fill in the slots or the entities based on the, the intent and what turn you're on. So by asking for the time, it's gonna say, hold on a second. And it's gonna go, all the time is fill in the entity. Okay. Now the state is, or the current context is what's happening, where you are in the story, right? So the story pipeline is what time is it in whatever, whatever. Okay, let me look that up. Okay, the time is whatever, whatever. So what time is it in Oslo? Oh, hold on. I'll look up what time it is in Oslo. Oh, it's, oh God, what would it be? 11 o'clock, right? Um, and so the, the computer is saving what state, where they're at in that story turn. And so let's say our intent is to order pizza, right? Give me a medium pizza. P medium pizza is an entity. Now don't think about the entities necessarily as NER specific, like, oh, it needs to be France. Right, entity is whatever slot or important information you're looking for. So entities can be whatever you define. Okay. So medium, entity is the size. Uh, extra cheese, entity is extra toppings. Okay. And then there, the intent for order pizza story would also have, how are you going to pay? Okay, um, anything else? Okay, where are we delivering this to? You know, And has a whole story it goes through. If you've ever been on the phone with ordering something over the phone, you can always tell when people like you to do it in order. So, you know, they're touching the screen, usually on our newer systems, putting in your order. And you can tell when someone is like, don't go out of order. <laughs> they want to do it in the order that their system wants them to do it in. And so they'll like ask you a question that you've already answered because they're doing it in the order that's on the screen, right? And it's got that same concept with the dialogue system. It wants you to go one to two to three. Okay. Uh, get stock quote might be how is Dow Jones doing today? Okay. So the entities are heavily going to depend on the context specificity. Okay. So once we find out the intent, we can use an NER type approach for figuring out what should go, what entities to grab, and what should go in those slots to go back. Okay. So we can train those using the same types of approaches that we used in our information extraction lectures. A lot of systems um, sort of circumvent this requirement by having you click a specific option, like here are some options that you can pick, and you, you click on one. Um, or they have you write their format, your text in a specific way so they know the answer. So that the entity here could be more structured or a simpler system. Okay, and you'll see that in the example today. And then once you know the entities, those responses can be determined in a few different ways. So just like the beginning of the semester where I said the hardest part is getting the data in the right format, here getting the entities out of the N intense, out of the uh, customer's text is one of the harder parts because once you have the intent, then you can tell it to funnel to a specific storyline. So we could use fixed responses to generate those answers back. And this is basically a dictionary lookup. If time zone Europe, then time is X. And the entity has these key value pairs and you know, it could be based on a recommendation system or it could just be based on literal text match. Okay, and that's how the one we're going to do today works. We could have these template responses. So the one today is actually a little bit of both. Um, and so it takes the entities from your text and fills them into a template in the code. Okay. Or it could be automatic. Okay, automatic is definitely the most difficult. So we're going from least difficult to most difficult. Whereas the first one's more of an FAQ type system, the second one is more of a dialogue with a goal system, goal oriented system, and the last one's more of a chit chat system. Um, 
where it's trained on many responses to give you something a bit more naturalistic. Uh, and that, so there's, I'm thinking of this, there's this other company that I have to um, get online and talk to their chat bot every once in a while. And then I end up talking to an agent. And one of the most interesting things is that they don't, I think, let their agents actually talk. And so you're never quite sure you're talking to a person because they have the same like canned response when you have an issue. And so I often wonder if they just have like a button, like customer has this issue, hit this button and it just like spits out this, I really, we really appreciate you working with our business. And we don't, that's not the, um, that's not the experience we want you to have. And I'm like, great, stop hitting that button. Just solve my problem. <laughs> you know, so there's um, a little bit of, of both of these uh, types of template responses used even with people who are actually talking to you. If they are, I don't know that they are. Okay. So templates are easier to train and they often have less grammatical issues. Notice here I don't say that they're clearer. Okay. So one thing you have to be aware of is that people read and interpret in many different ways and it's almost impossible to control all cultural and um, understanding contexts so even if your templates are super great, you should always have them looked at by another human to understand your own biases. Because when we write our own training data, it comes with our own biases. And um, you know, it may not, you may need customer feedback to know that your templates don't work, for example. Right. So the system we're gonna use today is Rasa. I looked at a bunch of different ones, so I'm having to re-record these notes <laughs> because Chatterbot stopped working with new versions of Python. So that's no fun. So we're gonna use Rasa. Now the interesting thing about Rasa is it's very similar to Spacey in the sense that it's a predefined architecture that you put new training data in. So I like that a lot, but the, the weird, the sort of in, in the part about it is that it's also mostly command line. So it does involve Python, but it is not Python heavy until you decide to write some actions. Okay, so we're mostly gonna focus on the command line. Like how do I set this up? And then how do I begin to manipulate it? Um, because I think for the Python component, it would heavily depend on goals, what the goals are of what you're trying to do and what systems and APIs your company might have. And then um, if there are already recipes for this type of information. And you'll see what I mean as we go. So it's an open source chatbot library that mostly runs in terminal, so mostly command line, but it's pretty flexible and easy to use. I learned it in the last hour. Okay, so I would say it was fairly um, simple to set up and simple to get started, but once you start getting more complex, it will take a little bit of work. Okay. So you can install Rasa the normal way using Python, depending on your choice of IDE or computer type. So I have data lore open um, and I just installed it using our environment here. Um, and I used, let me see. Oh gosh, I'm gonna have to restart here. What did I use? I think 3.6. I always get nervous when they have a brand new version that nothing will work properly. So I think it was 3.6. Yeah, 3.6.16. I also have this open in R Studio. So I use Reticulate to do this. Um, I not Python, right? right? Import Rasa. Rasa dot version. Can I get the version? Yeah, so I have 3616 at the time of recording of this lecture. Okay. All right. So you install it just like any other Python Python package through pip or conda or using your terminal or py install for RStudio. Okay. Now um, I wanted to quickly show how you get into a terminal, because that is not something we've spent a lot of time doing this semester. And so if you're going to use data lore, you would click on, I'm gonna close this, I don't know what it's doing, but you click on tools and the terminal and it will pull up the terminal next to it. Okay, what the heck is the terminal? Right, the terminal is like what your computer, <laughs> the actual like computer. <laughs> and um, if you're a Windows person, this is command line. If you're everybody else, it's a terminal. 
Um, and this is uh, sort of typing generally what's considered or sometimes called bash code. Okay. And uh, what Python does is it says, it talks to the terminal and the terminal is actually the computer part that's running it. And then it gives you the answer back, okay? R is the same way. Uh, and then in R Studio, you go to tools, terminal, new terminal. So we can see that it's opened my uh, terminal for this computer, Aaron's MacBook Pro, uh, for at the sort of home directory. Okay, and that'll be important in a second. All right. And then this one finally opened here. And the home directory for most of data lore is uh, notebook files. Okay, so here. And I can, you can hopefully see, go show me, no, 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 show me my files. You can see that I've already started this example. All right, once you install it, now we're gonna do all this work in terminal. Okay. So um, this part mostly is interactive. You wouldn't code this in a notebook. Okay. So we would go to the terminal to get started. And you're gonna be asked if you wanna install everything. So say yes. And then you'll be asked if you want to train an initial model. This will build you a, a blueprint or a template to start from. So I would also say yes. It's not a very good model. You'll see in just a second. But it's a good way to create all the files that you need to get started. Okay. So say yes. So you type rasa init for initialize. And you do that wherever um, you have it installed. So for me, I just typed it in terminal in both of them. Okay. Um, if you're using special virtual environments, you'll have to make sure that you're in the terminal window for that's that's using that environment. Um, and then it will also ask you where you want to put this, right? So let me show you. When so you can see I am also using a virtual environment here, so it knows that I've already installed it. If I type Rasa init, right? Please enter a path where you want to be this to be created. Okay, this is where it's gonna save all the files. So I have all of my stuff here. If you're not super good at paths, you can just tell it to do it right here where it is. But if you build more than one model, you might consider picking different paths. So in on a MacBook, similar on Windows, let's say I wanted to put it in downloads. Don't do that, but you could, or here. We'll say we wanna put it in files under GitHub or research. One thing I can do is get info and copy the whole path and it would allow me to cut and paste it in here. Okay, I'm not actually gonna run this because I don't need to install it again, um, but that would allow me to put it in a special place. If you are on Windows, you can do that same thing with File Viewer where you copy um, the path of the folder that you're in. All right, so I'm gonna close that just so I don't act do it again. Right. Now, I cut, I, uh, as I was doing this, I made some screenshots here and I am using a, uh, thank God for Medium, a tutorial um, that I copied from, but uh, I found the whole thing fairly simple, straightforward except for the actions part. Right? So once you get it, um, once you go through this process, the next thing that'll happen is let's say bot loaded. So it's ready to go. Uh, it may take a couple minutes, and if you're on a MacBook, it may give you some warning about Mac architectures. It's fine. Okay. So it'll say bot loaded, type a message and press enter. Okay. So I started talking to it. Hello, hey, how are you? I'm doing okay. Hey, how are you? Okay, what about you? I'm a bot. What can you do? Bye. <laughs> so it's not programmed with a whole lot to get started. There's some stuff there, but not a whole lot. And so if we look at the file structure that uh, it creates when it gets started, this is almost everything you need. Okay, so we've got actions, we've got data, the model, and the test. So I'm gonna talk about these specific data files. And what's super cool about them is that they're YAML files, which is the same stuff that's up here at the top of our markdown files. Okay? Now, Jupyter Notebooks and things like DataLore also have YAML, they just hide it from you. Okay? So the important parts, right? So the data in the data folder, the NLU YAML, it stands for Natural Language Understanding. 
Now, these are the files that have the intents. These are the semantic categories of the responses that you'd like to give. Okay. So one of the default ones is greeting. And let's go and look at that file. So if I click on data and then NLU, what we have are just a list of different intents. Okay. So if the intent category is classified as greeting, here are some answers that it can give back. Okay. If the intent ca category is by, here are some of the answers that they give back. I do think they're funny. See you later. Okay. Affirm, deny, mood great, mood unhappy. Um, and then we are at, we're going to add these here in a minute. Okay, so it ends at bot challenge. And so you have to think about these. These are basically the classification categories that you want all of the responses to go into. And so you might need a catch-all one that's like everything else that goes, I didn't understand that. And so you got you now you can start to write like what are the ants, what are the intents that I want this bot to answer? Okay. And now the intent name itself is just just for you. The user never sees that. Okay. All right. Next are the domain, and which is in the main folder, and the responses. Okay, so the domain YAML has the uh, definition of the types of intents. So you have the all of the intents. Um, we are going to add some more in here. Uh, so if we look at our domain YAML, one of the intents might be time zones. Hold on, let me back up here. So we end up having find time zone as one of the ones that we're going to add. But all of these intents need to be here in the NLU. OK, so we're mapping these files together. And then we uh, include the responses. So utter greeting, have a response. Hey, how are you? In the stories, there's a typo here. Let's just say stories file. You're creating the conversation flow. And so this is a story path. This is the dialogue flow of a goal-oriented dialogue system. Okay, so we're not doing the open-ended systems. We're doing goal-oriented systems. If the story is happy path, your intent might be greeting, uh, get a greeting. The action would be utter a greeting back. The intent then might be mood great and then utter happy. So one of the things I find um, potentially limiting about these systems is that if you wanted different story paths for different users, you'd have to program them all. So they could be combinatorially very large <laughs> where you have utter great, intent, mood, sad, action, utter sad, you know? And so you, you would have to program the mix and match here. Okay, so let's look at that stories file. Where is stories? I think it's under data, <clears throat> right? And so they start you with happy path, sad path one, sad path two, and we're gonna do asking time zone. Okay. So this Rasa system is really great for goal-oriented dialogue. Okay. So good for production kinds of systems. Now the rules file, <clears throat> excuse me, defines these flow rules. Okay, these are the overall rules. We have story flows that are this, then this, and this, and this, and this. And then we have sort of these generalized rules that no matter what happens in a story, if you get to this intent, do this. Okay, so these are sort of like breaking the story rules. Um, so you don't have to program every goodbye into the story. You can just say, um, hey, uh, so the rule names don't have to match anything, by the way. They can be very semantic. Give yourself good descriptions here. But say you book goodbye anytime a user says goodbye, no matter which storyline we're on, intent goodbye. Say I'm a bot anytime the user is challenging you in utter I'm a bot. So one more we could add here is say, I don't understand, right? So anytime that the bot doesn't figure out which category it should go into, and it has a sort of last catch-all category. So that's the starting point. Now, if we want to update and add our own specific pathway, so the example that I found was really great. It's about time zones. <laughs> and it works for me because I can never remember what time it is in Europe. And there's always this uh, time period in the fall where they where we do daylight savings time and they're a week, they take another week and then do daylight savings time and nobody knows what time the meeting is supposed to be in, right? 
maybe I could have a little bot that be like, remind me what time zone, what time it is where Timo is, for example. So in our NLU file, right, so our natural language understanding, we say, okay, well, the intent here is find time zone. Here are some examples that the user might say. Can you tell me the time? Could you tell me the time? Time zone, what time is it, right? So we're giving it the, the examples to learn from to, to figure out that intent. So these are the things that the user might say, and this is the intent the user wants. Right? Then we go, okay, the user is gonna have to tell us what time zone they want. So here are the examples of the time zones that um, we can handle. Now, this is very specific structure. We're gonna come back to this, but um, this is getting the city info from them. It also could be very complicated, but we could use this as a variable placeholder as well. Right now we're programming some specific entities and their target slots, but um, the more flexible you could be here, um, the better. Okay. But you could start with something very structured to get going. Okay. Intent, here's another one for thanks. And so remember this, the intent is just a label that we're gonna put over into one of our other files. The examples here are things that they might say that you should cue that this is the intent. Now in that domain file, we update and add our new intents. Okay, so these are the three that we've added. There's a bunch of stuff in the middle here and um, we're adding some of our updates, right? So utter ask city info, okay, this, is part of the story flow for the bot, right? So this is the utterance they're gonna give back to the find time zone intent. Do you wanna learn the time of which city? It's very awkward. Please give it to me in the structure. Utter find time zone. Give me a second to find up this, this time zone and you're welcome. So the utterances don't necessarily have to, at the moment, be mapped to a, a specific anything, but we're giving them names. These are the things the bot is going to say back. So let's go back and look at that domain file. I'll make this a little bit more solid, right? If the utter, the, the thing ends up being a greeting, utter a greeting, utter a cheer up, right? Utter did that help. So these are the utterances as part of the story flow. So um, our stories for the, are here. So if you check out asking time zone, we've got utter city info. If the intent is city info, utter finding time zone, right? So um, we're making a map between these. I do wish they'd all be in the same file. I think that would be a little easier, but I understand why it's separated, right? So these are all the responses within specific domains. So it's labeled under responses. And these intents just help us map onto the NLU page. So NLU, think about that as the user in, natural language user end. Okay, that's not what it stands for, but this is the user end. Domain is more the bot end. All right, did I cover all that? Yeah. So now we're going to add a new story path. Story path is think about dialogues. So story paths always have steps. And the steps go intent, action, intent, action. Okay. Now you can have two actions at once. Okay. But um, uh, it should always be intent, action. Okay. You don't usually have two intents at once because you once you have enter intent is waiting for what action should come next. Okay. So our intent is find the time zone. Okay. What city? Right. The intent city info where you give it all of the um, you give it specific answers back. Let's go back to city info, right. city info. So take those city pieces in that structure. The action, okay, give me a second. And then here, this one is actually a literal Python action. Okay, so there's two in a row because the bot says, hold on a second, the utterance. So they've started them with utter and action to keep them straight. And then the it, it says, oh, go do this. Okay, so this is the part where we tell it to go and talk to a task manager and it gives me the information back. If the intent is thanks, utter you are welcome. 
Now, if the intent goes, oh no, give me a different time zone, you could loop back to the beginning of the story. Now, um, so I don't think you have to program here, right? I don't have to program how many times it's gonna ask me the intent. So it will jump back to wherever the intent should be. Now, to get the bot to actually do things, we have to add a couple more pieces of information. So we've kind of got all the pieces where it's talking back and forth, but this is the part where we are um, creating the, the information for the task manager to run. So the bot itself, the chat bot part, doesn't know the time zones, and nor would it, right? Unless you program them manually. What you do instead is you program the spaces, the holding spaces, like the time zone's gonna go here. And you write a separate file, this is the Python part, where it actually looks up the time zone and fills it back in. So we've gotta have some variable placeholders to create that flow. Like, okay, I need to grab this piece and send it over to Python. And Python's gonna send me this other piece back. And so the way we do that is using entities. So they're calling them entities, but remember the entity does not have to be your traditional NAR, Paris, right? In this case, it kind of is, but it could be medi the word medium for pizza. Okay. So these are defined in that NLU file. And what you do is you put them in square brackets. This is the response the user is going to give, medium, right? And then give them a variable name to send to Python, okay? So we're calling this target time zone. That makes some sense. And this is the response that the bot is looking for. Okay. Now, this is where the pro you might have to program in a bunch of whole bunch of different expected response, people to spell stuff wrong or like different options. Like in these sorts of dialogue systems, you are expecting a very exact response. So it's looking for this ex almost exact response. Okay. But you know, that's a cut and paste thing. What like changing, is there spaces like, you know. And this is why a lot of systems use click options <laughs> because then the user can't enter the data wrong. Mm -hmm. They can try, but the, you know, if you have a very goal directed system that has four options, I would give them the options rather than letting them ask. <laughs> so in our domain file, okay, so this part was in the, um, this part is in the entity file. So this is um, built into, sorry, into the NLU, right? Because this is a user end response. So they're gonna say Europe, London, and we're gonna go, okay, that's the target time zone. So I'm gonna plug that, that piece into that variable and send it over. So this is effectively a saying target time zone equals Europe, London in quotes. Underneath that, in this domain file, we define these slots, okay? So let's go back over here to the domain file. Okay. There's an entity, target time zone. So anything in uh, this thing, parentheses, goes into our entity. So if we had more than one, if you asked, if people asked, um, what's the temperature, right? We could be target city. Now in our slots for target time zone, it's expecting a text. So this is like defining what kind of input we're expecting to send to Python. So it's expecting a string, right? It's map, the type is from entity and the entity is target time zone, okay? So we're pulling this from the entities list and that here's its entity name. So we're kind of like connecting all the dots here. And Rasa has more examples of how these look. I found this part to be a little like not super well defined, but they have a bunch of examples. Right? So you're telling it what type of variable you're expecting and how it's going to map. So it's expecting it from an entity slot and the entity name. All right, back over here. And then the last thing we add to our domain file is the name of the action. And this is the part, we haven't looked at this file yet. This is the actual Python code that's doing the work. So let's look at that real quick. So come over to Rasa, we've got actions and actions.py. And this is what is um, completing the action. So this is the Python code that looks up um, 
using the world time API to look up the time zone. So return action find time zone is what he is here in their actions. So spelling really important. Okay. Now, that action is put into the stories. We've already looked at this, but now I just want to make connect the dots here that here's where the action is. So it is in the um, domain file under actions. It's in the story so that it knows to like actually run this action at this point in the story pipeline in the dialogue, run this action now. And then it's here in the actions file to know which one it is. Okay. Now notice it does not have to be named the um, like this class function here. Um, it doesn't have to be named what you're returning. It's the return that has to be uh, it has to match. Okay. Now this is very specifically structured. Um, and then this is where I would look up what, you know, how to do these in, in Rasa to give yourself more examples. So this is from one of their examples. Um, and they have a bunch of different ones that you can use, but kind of the, the main part of the code that you would be writing would be here. Okay. What do I say back? Right. Um, so let's okay here. We create this actions.py script that completes the code, and it could be as simple as adding two numbers together. This one actually is, you know, talks to an API and says, get this time zone and brings it back. Um, and so let me show you the important parts because this it, the setup here uh, is, a, is pretty structured. Okay. The important part here, target time zone, that's the variable that came it came with, it goes, ah, here's the variable I'm looking for, right? Tracker, get the slot, target time zone. So we've got to pull it from the text that the system has read. Try, okay, request, get, try the target time zone. If the request actually returns something, then we can fill in, this is a variable placeholder. It says the time zone is, fills in the time zone. If you don't get an answer because it's not really structured the right way or there's a typo, you can return, I didn't understand that, or hey, type it this way, please. Okay. Or um, if the whole thing is not running because it has too many requests on the API, you take a pause. Okay. Now this part is part of their system, right? Utter message and respond the text and return. So you're kind of doing more of this component. What do you want it to say? Well, like, what is the actual code that you want it to run? And what do you want it to say back if the code returns something that it can return or an exception? So a lot of this other stuff stays the same. So last thing that you have to do to make this whole thing work is um, basically tell it to run Python at the same time. So endpoints.yaml, this is the part that makes it production. Okay? And so this will heavily depend on your system. But for us and doing this on our own computers, we have to al allow the actions to actually run in the background. And this is the connection between the bot and our code so they can talk to each other. Okay? When the bot's running in a terminal, it's doing its own thing. But it will it needs to talk to somebody. Right? And it's not talking to the internal system, it's talking to a separate system. Now that's just run through localhost here. So it's a web hook is what it's called. Um, if you've ever done any kind of JavaScript, which I'm slowly learning and it's mur murdering me sideways, I do not like it. <laughs> um, this is a very common use term, uh, but essentially it is like, oh, go look for the answer over here and I will give you an answer back. So it kind of allows a, a call and response. Now, if you're in um, uh, any system, you, that means you have to have two terminals. One terminal that is running the actual chatbot and another terminal that's running the Python code that, uh, that looks up the answers. Okay. So we go tools, terminal. Now I've got two open. Okay. In our studio, we might do tools, terminal, 
terminal. So now I've got one. This is where I would tell it to run the uh, chat bot. And then you just open another one, terminal, new terminal. And then you change which one you're looking at here. And you'll see why that's important in a second. Get back to the notes. Keep having to move my face around. <laughs> there we go. So we uh, open up this endpoints. This is actually in programmed into their system. You just um, uncomment it so it can actually run. If your system doesn't have any actions, you don't need this. Now what? Okay. So in the terminal, we would type Rasa train and Rasa shell. Rasa shell just means start, basically, like run, please, and tell it to open. Okay. In a separate terminal window, we need to do Rasa run actions. So I'm going to try this. Well, I've already run this. So I'm going to just do um, Rasa shell. I do want to show you. When I open my terminal, this is not actually the where my file, my data is, right? So if I tried Rasa shell, it would be like, uh, are you sure about that? Right? So I have to go back to the folder that this is in, which I have folders and folders and folders. Please don't judge me. No judges. And so I'm going to copy get info and copy this. Copy. And so how do I get to a specific folder? This is true in Windows and Unix like systems. So CD for change directory. Paste that in there. I think it did not, yeah, so it didn't put me in that folder. All right, now if I type Rasa shell. It will start running. Right. It gives me a little bit of complaint about my Mac. Right. And it is using Keras in the background, so deep learning system. Now in another terminal, I need to run Rasa run actions. Okay. So I'm gonna hit the up arrow to get to back to my folder here. When I run actions, it's up and running. So we could look at that window, right? And this is essentially the API component for it. So it is, this is when we send a request, we'll be able to see it here. Okay, so let's go back. Uh, requested URL not found. Oh, because I haven't actually told it to do anything yet. All right, now I'm back in terminal. Let's go back to terminal two. And so what do I say? We can say, hello, I think. Say, what time is it? Okay, what time do I want? So let's go Europe, Liz. And so give me a second to look at that time zone. So that was the storyline. And then it said, hey, here's the time zone. Okay, right. now I could probably format the time zone better. Right. Um, so I guess it's midnight there. Okay. Uh, thanks. Right. And I apparently didn't pick up thanks. So we have to, maybe we would need to work on our programming for thanks a bit better. So last time it didn't even give me the time zone. So I'm doing better this time. So let's go back. Thanks. The intent here is thanks. Other, you are welcome. So um, it's not, it didn't, the training for thanks didn't seem to work. Let's try thank you. Nope. Great. Thanks. Okay. So the thanks part is not potentially working. So you could try a bunch of different tests to see what you may need to do some more training on. All right, back to the notes here. Um, and interestingly, it still did not show me the uh, requests. Hmm. So it gave me the right request. It's not here. Maybe if I refresh it? Hmm. Don't know. Normally it would show you the request in this window. You do have to have them on at both times because they're each doing different things. Okay, that's the important key here. So test it out. So here's the answers that I got when I did Berlin, um, Europe. It was like, but no thanks, can't do that. So this time it worked for me um, and gave me some answers. So why would I do this? This is kind of the end of like, here's how to how to build one. Now, your specific use case could be very different here. It could, you know, you could be tying it to the API as your own company that looks up the prices of objects, for example. 
So it's hard to know how to tell people to program the Python actions component because it's really going to depend on what you're wanting to do. But here's an example that looks up um, time zones, right? So if you're wanting to um, potentially, maybe like you're wanting to build a, a simple dice game, it could be that you're having it calculate um, a roll, like give me a random roll of the dice, right? And then give the answer back to the user. Oh, you rolled a six, you lose, right? So there are um, a lot of options here. And the, the Python part will heavily depend on what you're trying to look up. Right? But hopefully students in my class uh, get some basic idea of requests because we've done requests before. This is a request that does a specific API. It looks up the time zone. All right, so why would I build one of these systems? Well, there's a lot of a lot of reasons, good and bad, but we could increase customer interaction and provide information without needing to pay for humans. So this, you know, there's this sort of balance between paying um, for human operators that's tossed time and money and customer satisfaction, right? So if you can find that right balance of I can actually give the customers the answers that they want, they're okay with chatbots. Like we're fine with them when we can get the answer we want, right? It does reduce customer service costs because maybe you're filtering out a lot of people by sending them to a specific FAQ. This is data, right? What people are entering, what is the most commonly searched thing? Maybe put that as a pinned FAQ. So looking up what people are actually asking the bot could be really good information for you. Right? It could create a positive experience for customers. This would be take a, a, some good training and uh, maybe some market research to get right. But the, with that, you could have, um, you know, satisfied customers, for example. And then, uh, you know, this is heavily based towards towards industry. But if you were writing a system, um, let's say you're trying to write a system for a healthcare company, uh, it could help direct customers to the right place to call. It could help customers find their personal records. I mean, there are a lot of uses here that have nothing to do with money. <laughs> this one is all about money, but um, you could also, let's say it's almost tax season. You could be directing people towards the right forms to fill out. And God knows the IRS needs some better customer service, right? So um, from an American, <laughs> we could be uh, helping pipe people to the right type of form to fill out and a bit and answering their questions, right? And that means we have less people calling constantly. So there are a lot of, of, of use cases. This is just an example for from a business perspective. And so let's wrap this up. What have we learned? Um, the types of chatbots, the responses, the terminology. I think the terminology is fairly different. The light, nice thing about Rasa I like is that it uses the literature's terminology. So if you were ever to read some scientific research on this type of stuff, those are the words they're going to use. NLU, domain, stories. Okay. Um, so I think it's nice that those two things map together pretty, pretty consistently. Um, and really, I don't think I hit this point well enough. I was sitting there thinking um, about this is that the chatbots are literally everything we've done this semester crammed into one. Right, the user has to, it has to classify the intent. And we could see that the model that I just trained once, right, normally you train a lot more, could, didn't figure out the thanks intent, right? So it didn't know what to do. And we'd better if our system didn't return an empty response, right? It actually returned like, I don't understand this response, which is, would be a little silly for thanks, but that would be a good clue that we aren't getting that part right. And so that's classification, right? But it's also text summarization. It's understanding how that, what the, the meaning of that text is, what the most important keywords are from that text, right? And then um, the slots and entity systems is NER. So we've used three of the systems that we've talked about before, and those use things like part of speech tagging. Text cleanup is an important part of this as well. Um, and so that really just hits all of the, the things we've covered all semester. So that's why we end on chatbots is because it is like a culmination of all the goals. Now, are there other things we can do? Certainly like semantic analyses and sentiment analysis, blah, blah, blah. But uh, chatbots really kind of summarize nicely like all of the pieces working together. And we did not do chatterbot. I forgot to update this. So this chatbot creation with Rasa, 
Okay, because Chatterbot stopped updating with Python 3.7 and we're on Python almost four. So hence the update to the notes here. And we talked a little bit about why chatbots are really useful. And I think you could think of many more reasons than I gave you guys. They are um, a way of life at this point. So uh, programming good ones should also be something we're, we're interested in. Okay. So that wraps up the, the lecture for chatbots and the entire semester. So thanks for traveling along with us on this NLP journey.